Hello, everyone. Um, in this talk is called Tricks and Tools for Writing Elixir Test by Brian Merrick. Brian, the broadcast now belongs to you. Okay, thank you. If for some reason, oh, there we go. So I'm going to talk about three things in this talk. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about some tricks and tools that are easy to adopt, some that are then some that are harder to adopt, and then how we as a community can make it easier to adopt the harder ones. So I'm going to be changing a test starting with the next slide. It's a test of some code that uses Ecto. In case you're not familiar, I'll just explain what an Ecto change set is. A chain set is essentially a structure that wraps some old data, typically another structure, in this case, a structure called service gap. And then in the function that's using the chain set processes some outside data, typically like params that come from HTTP and uses that to populate a map inside the chain set called changes, where each of the changes corresponds to one of the fields in the old data. In the, pro in the course of making those changes or processing the changes, it may be the case that some of the changes, proposed changes, fail validation. In that case, the service gap will be marked, I'm sorry, the change set will be marked invalid or valid equals false, and another part of the change set, the errors field, will be populated with error messages indexed by the field that is in error. So that's a change set. Here's a test of a function that accepts a form from somewhere, HTTP param data as delivered to a, a Phoenix controller action, and it produces your standard OK tuple that we're used to from Elixir and Erlang in a thousand different APIs. It binds change set to the second value of the tuple and asserts that that change set is valid. Then because most of what we care about for uh, in this particular function except form is the changes it creates. We bind a variable changes to the changes field within ch the change set. And then we make a series of four assertions on the changes such that changes.id is equal to one. So that's a test. And now I wanna ask a question, which is what fields were tested in that test. Now, that's somewhat of an unfair question because I didn't warn you that you were going to be asked that question, but it's also something of a typical question because most people, when they come to read tests, don't come to absorb them in all their test glory, they come there with a very specific question that they want answered as quickly and easily as possible, such as, I made a change to the code, this test broke, what's different about this test from the test that didn't break? And so when people are going to read a test, they will very often really appreciate it if the test is scannable. That is, if they can read it quickly to find the answer they want. So what we're gonna do in the first part of this talk is we're gonna take the previous test and make it more scannable. So the first thing that I do is I'm replacing the four separate assertions with a function called assert fields. Assert fields takes a keyword argument or a keyword list argument and of value or keys to check and the values to check in those keys. Now, I wanna claim that this, what you're seeing before is easier to scan, it'd be easier to answer the question that I asked earlier. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that the, the syntax coloring that my editor uses 
makes Adam stand out nicely. And so uh, as opposed to the previous case where everything was kind of dull, monotone white, here the most important things about what I'm asserting are in blue and stand out. The other reason is the assertions are, uh, they have empty space on the left of them, which is makes it easier to scan vertically than when there's a bunch of text on the right, especially since that text is all the same and all kind of boring. So that's one set of changes I made. The other set of changes I made was that rather than put the value I'm asserting about inside assert fields as the first argument, I pipe it into assert fields with uh, uh, the standard elixir pipe operator. So the reason I'm doing that is because idiomatically in elixir, we're used to seeing pipe operators, we're used to seeing pipelines of this sort, and we're used to thinking that the top of the pipeline is in some sense what this pipeline is about. And that's true in this case. This pipeline is about the changes in the change set. And it's easier to see that if you have the, the value on top of a pipeline than if it's in line inside of a cert fields. Now, except uh, it's not really the case that this test is about the changes, it's about the change set because we have an assert change set dot valid up there. So what we'll do is we'll move the assert valid, the test for validity into the pipeline. So now we have a nice scannable summary of what this test is about. It's about a change set that's got to be valid. It has particular changes. And if we want to know more detail about what changes it's testing, here they are in a way that nicely stands out. Another thing I want to look at is we've all seen OK tuple and pattern matching a, a billion, billion times. It's not really necessary that we see it again. So let's make use of pipelining. So now we have uh, the next to last version of that this test. At the very top is what it is that I'm actually testing, except form. So it's not over to the right of the screen. It's right there on the top. Then we assert that the result of ex except form is an OK, uh, content wrapped in an OK. Then we assert what's true about that content. Now there's one problem that I actually only noticed when I was making these slides is that we've sort of, oh, I want to mention, by the way, that assert changes is just a, a shallow wrapper around assert fields. It just applies assert fields to change set dot changes. So when I was writing these, I realized something, which is that we've actually lost the word change set in here. And maybe it should be more obvious than we're, that we're actually testing a change set. And so the way I choose to do that is I wrote a variant of OK content, which takes an argument, change set. So what OK content says is it says, first of all, we want an OK tuple and we fail with a nice assertion error if it's, um, if it's not OK. Second, we extract the content. And third, the content must be a change set. Now, we would get a failure in later lines if it wasn't a change set. But by making it an explicit argument, I can write, uh, I, I can write a better error message. So a K content will produce a, a nicer error message. And I have to say, by the way, I've built on top of a lot of unit testing tools over the past 20 years or so. And EXUnit is one of the nicest to build on top of because it lets you write 
good, lets your custom assertions generate good error messages as in the same way that the built-in assert macro does. Uh, and then whoever wrote assert unit, they did our ex unit, they did a really nice job. So congratulations for that. Okay, so my claim is that the assertion or the test that you just saw is better than this test, more readable than this test, and no more difficult to write than this test and produces just as good error messages. So if you also like that, uh, you will be glad to know that there are packages on hex that let you write assertions in this pipelining style. Flow assertions has a dependency only on the Elixir kernel. Ecto flow assertions has a dependency on Ecto, so it's used for testing, uh, making assertions about change sets and Ecto schemas. Everything I'm going to talk about is mentioned on the last slide, so you don't have to write any of this stuff down. Okay, I'm going to talk about a, a, another hex package called Phoenix Integration, which was written by Boyd Malter, and it lets you write tests like this. This is a workflow test. The application I'm using is one that's used to create, uh, to reserve animals at a veterinary teaching hospital for purposes of teaching. So a professor might say, I need two cows on such and such a date and time uh, to demonstrate haltering or bandaging and to let students practice that. So you go through three, three screens to create a reservation. Uh, the first step is we use a get uh, to get the starting form. Uh, get via action is mine. It's a thin wrapper over con.test.get. I have this kind of weird quirk where I like, when I'm testing a controller, I like my test to be phrased in terms of the actions in the controller rather than the routes you use to get to those actions. Um, but this is all still the same uh, testing mechanism as you're used to for Phoenix, for Phoenix testing. So get, uh, get via action retur returns a con structure, which is this giant structure that contains a lot of stuff, including HTML. That HTML is passed to follow form. Follow form is, this is a function from Phoenix integration. And it goes into the uh, HTML, parses it using Floki, and reassembles the form data into the same form that it's passed to um, a Phoenix controller action. So it does some of the various nice things that Phoenix does for you that make you not have to deal with how horrible and awful HTML forms are. So it converts it into a nice nested map structure with lists and everything as appropriate. You can now edit that form structure by giving it keys, fields to replace. One nice thing about follow form is you only have to specify the values you want to change. And that is surprisingly nice because it's really annoying creating you know, endless sets of complicated form parameters when the only thing a test is about is one single part of the form. And this lets you write again more readable tests. So then follow form ships that off to uh, a Phoenix controller action using the normal Phoenix mechanisms. You get another form back. In this one, you produce animals. Notice that you, on the line after, just below the arrow, you can pass in an array and it knows how to make that work, whereas HTML forms don't have any notion of arrays. Uh, then we pick procedures and then we go down and we have a, a little bit of assertion. 
Now, this is a workflow test. Most of the asserting work is done in unit tests of individual actions. What this test is about is about demonstrating that a user can actually navigate through a sequence of actions that work together to produce a final result. Uh, individual unit tests don't necessarily catch bugs in a workflow like that. Okay, so I like Phoenix integration. Um, and there are some other nice things about Phoenix integration that, by the way, I think fit nicely into what German Velasco was talking about earlier. But I only get 30 minutes, so I'm not going to talk about those nice things. I did a write up of one of them that I'm going to link to at the end. Okay, now I'm going to look at the harder to adopt bits. So again, this is for reserving animals for procedures. And here you can see that uh, Dr. Morin reserved animals Beth and Bossy for hoof exam and care. So to demonstrate that. Now, hoof exam and care is a very non-invasive procedure. You can examine a cow's hooves all day, every day, and the cow won't care as long as you uh, let it keep eating, which is what cows do about 23 hours out of every day. But there are some procedures that are more invasive. They're more stressful for the animal. And so you're only allowed to do them to an animal every so often. And in this case, we'll be talking about uh, how you would test a procedure that says, no, you can't use that animal for that procedure because that's a twice per week procedure and uh, the animal you're asking for has already had that procedure performed twice in the, in the week we're talking about. Now, uh, the interesting thing is it's Postgres via a query that makes the determination of of whether you're using an animal too much. So there's a big complicated, semi-complicated query into Postgres that gives you back uh, errors, rejections. Uh, and what that means is that in order to test this, you have to create a complicated, semi-complicated interleaf, interlinked structure in Postgres with foreign keys pointing all over the place and that kind of thing. Creating such structures is notoriously annoying and uh, fragile as things change, which can tend to lead to bad, bad short-term decisions that buy you trouble in the long term. So it's a problem. And here is the way I solve uh, for this application, the problem of creating these reservation structures. I start with a function called empty repo. Empty repo is a little bit of a misnomer in that it actually does something. It ensures that we have a species in the database. Now, in this test, we're not going to care what the species is, but you have to have a species before you can have animal data and you have to have a species before you can have procedure data. So we have to have some species, but we don't name it because it's not relevant. Then there's a procedure called haltering whose frequency is twice per week. Uh, I noticed too late that this is actually wrong. Haltering is something you can do as often as you want, but let's pretend it's something you can only do twice per week. What procedure the function is going to do is it can it creates a procedure whose name is haltering, which is of the species that we care about, or of the species we're working with, though we don't care about it, and it links it to the twice per week row in the frequency table. So having done that, we say, I want to reserve a set of animals, which happens to be the single animal bossy, to demonstrate the following procedures, which happens to be the single procedure haltering. And I want that reservation for Wednesday. Now, the interesting thing here is we've talked about haltering before, but we didn't talk about bossy. So reservation force 
sees that we're referring to an animal that doesn't exist and it creates that animal. This is an animal about which we know nothing except that one, it exists, two, it's of the species that we're working with, and three, that uh, its name is bossy. So everything else is filled in with default values. And I use ex machina and um, something else that I forget uh, for my, populate, to my population. I mentioned both of them at the end. Okay, having created an animal, reservation for now uh, makes a use. So a use is an animal procedure pair, and it links that use through its foreign key to a new reservation row in the table. So now I've got a reservation in the data set. I create another reservation for the same animal and procedure, because that's what we're worried about. And uh, I give it the date Monday. Uh, Monday and Wednesday are just uh, date values, elixir date values. OK, so I have a slogan, um, which is almost 20 years old. I've been saying that your ideal for a test should be that every word in a test should be relevant to the purpose of that test. Words that aren't relevant are noise, they get in the way of readers, they make it harder to write, and they tend to be associated with maintenance problems down the road. So I want to claim that this test, this setup code, because that's what this is, setup code, uh, is actually pretty good. There's not a lot of wasted words here. Now, the rest of the test, in a first version looks like this. And it's good in some ways because this is very visually obvious. We've got a Wednesday and a Monday. We're looking for conflicts for Friday. And if there are conflicts, we get back the reason, which is that there are that animal is reserved for that procedure on Monday and Wednesday, which is information that gets displayed when the user is told, no, you can't do that. That's good. This information, while it's important that it be true, it's always going to be true in the following sense. A lot of programming, especially, especially functional programming, is about taking big globs of data and transforming them into other big globs of data. Uh, the other, maybe a completely different structure, maybe the same structure with some fields updated, but that's a lot of what we do is just transform data from one place to another, from one form to another. Um, it is typically the case, often the case, that only one piece of that original data that we're transforming is very interesting. A lot of it is trivial. This is an example of trivi triviality. Yes, the animal and the procedure are copied from the big complicated input to the output, but they're not changed in any way. And every single test that has an error is going to test the same thing the copy that this copying happens. So what I want to do is take the boring parts out of the text of the test and put them into support code. And so I have done the following. Um, this is the final version of that test, which says, uh, Monday and Wednesday are existing reservations. Then we try Friday and we get an error that mentions Monday and Wednesday. Now, error mentions that function also tests that the animals are, the animal and procedures are correct. But since that will be true of every error mentions test, every test that contains error mentions, there's no reason to repeat it in all of them. So I kind of like this form. Uh, what we've got here is the full set of tests that describe how twice per week works. Uh, and it fits all on one slide. 
it's kind of tabular and tables are useful because they're easier to scan and compare rows in than our big blocks of text. So you can easily start at the top and look and quickly see what's special about each of those tests. So uh, this is what I consider a good test. I do not by any means always achieve the level of quality I'm advocating here, but this is what I shoot for in my in my own test writing. Okay, so um, briefly, I'm going to talk about making it easier for you and people like you to adopt this kind of tabular testing, test data builders that are in this style. Now, I'm going to do that by way of a digression. I'm really old. And I remember the time before 2000 when programmers didn't test. Or if they tested, it was because they were junior testers who weren't junior programmers who weren't trusted to touch the product code. So they were, uh, say, go and write some tests for the code that the more serious people, the more accomplished people have written. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that ch that's changed since then. Uh, starting around 2000, testing is now respectable. Programmer conferences have talks about testing. And that happened for a number of reasons. One of them being that test-driven design suits programmers better than uh, other than the way we used to do testing. But one big reason was JUnit. JUnit meant you could download something from the internet, you could start writing tests, and you could start making useful tests almost immediately. You didn't have to write your own unit testing framework before you could start unit testing. Now, what I'd like to say is that I'm creating a Ecto test data builder hex package, which I am, and that you'll be able to download it and immediately start doing J unit style testing, that is, start making immediate progress. And that's not really the case because all of these things have embedded in them domain dependencies. You can't start building test data for your database schema without writing something about your database schema. So there's that hump to get over. And a lot of people don't get over it. And what I want to do is I want to make it easier to get over that hump, to make it easier to adopt these, what I consider better styles of testing. And the way to do that, I propose, is that we start with domain dependent examples. I have this program called Critter for Us. It's open source. There are other people who have other programs also open source. We need to make those examples accessible to other people. So we need to explain them well. We need to write down what I would say to a person coming on to my project who wanted to understand how to use this stuff. Uh, we need to probably make some adjustments to those examples to make them more useful for learning because we have a different audience, people who want to adopt uh, test builders, for example. And basically, we need curation. We need somebody to put all this stuff together and make it useful in the way that people have put together all sorts of documentation and information about, say, Phoenix or Ecto. And I propose uh, that I be that person because I, I was kind of drifting toward retirement before coronavirus, but I think I'm now definitely retired. And what that means is I no longer feel obliged in doing the work I do to make money or potentially to make money. I can do things that are socially useful instead. So what I'm asking for in this talk is that people start uh, start exploiting me. 
and I think I'm lost. Oh, somebody, well, there's one more slide that I cannot, ah, here we go. Um, if you want to see more, if you want to see the list of things I talked about here, which are these, go to elixirtesting.topicbox.com. Uh, that's where I have a write-up of all of these things, and you can just click through rather than have to type. And if there's a problem, talk to me at merrickatexampler.com or at Merrick. And with that, I'm done. Thank you so much, Brian. It was a really great talk. Um, please contact him for questions. Uh, we are running out of time. So uh, thank you so much for the talk. Thank you.